can I invite you to join with me by holding your hands together in a tight fist as I share with you a poem. You might find it helpful to close your eyes. I want to practice being free. I want to unstitch my heart from the edge of my sleeve so that I can give it a life of its own. A real chance to love and be known. I want to practice opening my mind, my doors and the window panes, anything with a hinge, everything with a frame, until the breeze carries through a new point of reference, truth and you. I want to practice a holy escape. Losing track of my minutes that turn into days because the only time that matters now is time with you and this golden hour. I want to practice release. Removing the stones that weigh down my wings. Stones of fear, shame and grief. Stones that build walls between you and me. I want to do all these things, be untamed and wild, open and free, the first to give and the last to hold tight, because gratitude and clenched fists never felt right. I'm just starting to see that this life is a river, a holy stream, and if life is a river, then God is the sky, touching everything at once and inviting us to try, letting go of the raft to float on our backs so that we and God can be eye to eye. A lifetime of baptism and nothing but sky. But first, you have to release. Now release your hands, open your eyes, and take a deep breath. Today is our season of first fruits, a dedication service which I believe is a relatively new tradition in the life of our congregation. It's a time we have intentionally set aside to reflect on giving. Coming together today as we dedicate our gifts, our commitments, our hopes and visions to God. And thank you to Mark who has led us through these reflections, prompting us to participate in online and paper pledges, which encourages us to give regularly so that we can build up a sustainable budget that supports our growing ministry. And guess what? You can still pledge online and on the pieces of paper you'll find at the church today. All right, the first reading today comes from the book of Leviticus, um, chapters 19, verses 9 to 10. Then 25, verses 8 to 12. Uh, Leviticus 19, 9 to 10. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, or gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the alien. I am the Lord your God. And then to 25, 8 to 12. Uh, continues. You shall count off seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the period of seven weeks of years gives 49 years. 
then you shall have, have the trumpet sounded loud on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement. You shall have the trumpet sound throughout all your land, and you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and you shall proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. You shall return, every one of you, to your property, and every one of you to your family. That fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. You shall not sow or reap the aftergrowth, or harvest the unpruned vines. For it is a jubilee, it shall be holy to you. You shall eat only what the field itself produces. And from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, uh, where are we? verses 38, 38 through 44. This is uh, Jesus talking to the scribes. As he taught, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honour at banquets. They devour widows' houses, and for the sake of appearance, they long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which were worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have contributed to the treasury, for all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had, to live on. And in this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I hate money talk. My brother-in-law keeps telling me to read The Barefoot Investor, but I don't even want to think about money. On a rational level, I know that if Andrew and I were to talk more about money, to make plans, to make actual budgets, to get ourselves organised for the future, for our retirement, to take a holiday without the worry of, can we really afford this? Then life could be a little bit easier, or perhaps just the reality check that we need. Of course, not everyone is like this. There are people that I dearly love who find joy and satisfaction in their financial spreadsheets and filing systems. They know exactly how much money is in their bank account on any given day. To me, that's a miracle. <laughs> they might even feel compelled to tell me how many tea bags I could have bought from the supermarket for the one tea bag I just bought from the cafe. But it's not about the tea bag, I would say. It's about the experience of sitting down together. And yes, I know we can do that for free at home. But we all have money stories. And I wonder if there's anyone here today, perhaps not, who was a child living, growing up, in the Great Depression. Anyone? Wow, Neil, that's showing your age. I can only imagine the stories about money and lack of that you would tell. And there are those of you who have told me stories about the rationing of tea and sugar, butter and milk, clothing and petrol during World War II. And I can even remember the distress of the recession that we had to have in 1991. At church camp, I heard someone tell a story about a time in their life when every slice of bread had to be accounted for just so they could survive. And this story brought back memories from my own life and I find, found myself recalling feelings of anxiety and shame and fear all tangled up in my own sense of self-worth. It's interesting, isn't it? The different stories about money that run around in our head, influencing our feelings, our decision-making, our judgment of others, our sense of self. Today, our lives are consumed by money talk. Everything is more expensive, interest rates are rising, you have to take a loan out just to buy a lettuce. The funny thing is that when I was growing up, 
I somehow got it into my head that wealthy people were bad. Middle class and poor people were good and closer to God. Yet over many years, I have slowly watched these deeply held narratives unravel and fall apart as we became a two-income family, as we built our very own home, as Andy bought an old yet fancy second-hand car, as I said yes to a holiday to Bali, and yet I feel compelled to tell everyone that I haven't been overseas for over 18 years, so I'm not living extravagantly. <laughs> Why am I telling you all this? I'm telling you this because talking about money is profoundly uncomfortable. It feels too personal, too vulnerable, like it's nobody else's business. But the problem is, Every time that Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God, he is, in part, speaking about money. How we make it, how we spend it, how we give it, and what it does and doesn't do for our neighbour. Jesus is unapologetically addressing us as individuals, as households, and as a church, because money matters. Money matters shapes our relationship with God. Money influences our understanding of discipleship and what it means to be the church. Money impacts our capacity, our readiness and our imagination for mission. We may well be a church unaccustomed and uncomfortable with money talk. And we don't ever want to be a church that pressures and manipulates people into giving. But if we think that we can avoid the real question of how we practice money, or whether our faith allows us to live in a new way, then we are reading the Bible with blinkers on. In our reading from Leviticus 25, we hear what is probably the most radical idea in the Bible, the year of Jubilee. So radical, in fact, that there's no evidence that it actually took place in history. And yet, we still remember that God declared to Moses that every 50 years, the people were to return to their own lands, and so return the lands and the properties, including the slaves, that they had acquired during the hustle and bustle of the economy to the original owners. Land given back, debts cancelled, slaves released and restored to what was once theirs. Can you imagine it? It sounds impossible. Yet this is God's dream for our world. <coughs> With the sound of the trumpet, a year of jubilee, a year of jubilation, a year of release, and the mad scramble of accumulation and acquisition is broken. This is what Mary sings about as she anticipates the birth of her son. How God would bring down the mighty from their thrones and lift up the lowly. How God fills the hungry with good things and sends the rich away empty. Mary was singing in a spirit of jubilee. It may not have happened, but the hope that this hope, this promise, <coughs> it never died in the hearts of God's people. One commentator writes, at the center of biblical faith is a command from God that curbs economic <coughs> transactions by an act of communal sanity that restores everyone to proper place in the economy. Because life in the community of faith does not consist of getting more, but in sharing well. I imagine 
but there has been many a stewardship sermon that has rolled out the story of the widow and her two coins as a fine example of sharing well. For she gives her whole life, everything she has to live on. But what if Jesus is telling this money story for another reason? What if Jesus is drawing the disciples' attention to the widow's offering as an illustration of how the system has failed her? The temple treasury was meant to support and protect the widows, the dispossessed, the vulnerable. It was meant to act as a safety net. By giving to the treasury, the rich were fulfilling their responsibility so that the widows did not have to. I wonder if this story is asking us to reimagine an ancient and new way of giving and receiving in the life of community. I wonder how this story might ask us to address how the world's transactional influence has taken hold of the life of the church. Because we are not participating in a user-paid system. We, the church, participate in a spirit of solidarity, compassion, and radical neighbourliness. We give and we receive in a spirit of thankfulness. We give and we trust with a hope that reaches always beyond ourselves. We give with eyes of justice and equality for the world as God would see it. We give in freedom and in love. Jesus shows us again and again how the world is filled with abundance, how we are created for generosity, how bread broken and shared is enough for all. I think one of the reasons that we struggle to talk about money in our church is because of an awareness or a self-consciousness that there are a few people who <coughs> give incredibly generously to this church. And so we're fearful that by talking about money, it would be like asking them to give more. And in the same way, we are afraid that any money talk might unnecessarily burden anyone who is struggling to make ends meet, or who are still exploring their sense of belonging to this church. So for all the right reasons, we have made it very hard for us to address what it means for us to take responsibility for the life of this congregation, for its ministry, for its vision together. And for all the right reasons, we have resisted Inviting people to make a financial commitment as a powerful experience of release and blessing. But the truth is that we are facing a deficit. The impact of COVID, irregular attendance, the establishment of our connect groups, all these things and more have put pressure on the church budget. While at the same time, we are committing ourselves to growing a vibrant, <coughs> inclusive, intergenerational congregation. And the truth is that even with the extraordinary gift from the Synod Mission Growth Fund, including Margaret Scribner's bequest, our church budget needs to radically grow and flourish over the next five years. If we are to support the vision of building our ministry team to include a full-time youth and family minister. The truth is that this season of first fruits at this time in our lives was never going to be easy. 
because it asks something profoundly personal of us. To reimagine our relationship with God, with this congregation, and with our resources. Jesus once said, "You, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one or love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And then he said, don't be anxious, because everything you need will be given to you. And then he said, but seek first the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In all our vulnerabilities and hope, let's just be honest. Let's figure out what are the money stories that are out of date, that are running around our heads and influencing the life of this congregation. And let's ask God to heal and transform them. Let's do the vulnerable work of examining what trust in God looks like in our lives and in our life together. Let's not be content to just sing about seeking the kingdom of God. Let's reset our eyes, our priorities, our hearts, our gifts, our skills, our resources to living into the kingdom of God in the here and now for today, but also for tomorrow. In Galatians, Paul writes, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment, love your neighbour as yourself. Can we imagine for a moment that our neighbour is the church that our children will inherit. What would it look like for us to organise ourselves in such a way that we can love towards that future church as we love one another today? David, our treasurer, has a saying that I really like. The budget is there to serve the church, not the other way around. Our budget needs to serve a vision that might feel risky and beyond us right now. But isn't that the purpose of the church? To believe the impossible? to proclaim a love that bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, to bear witness to a world yearning for jubilee. Let us find the courage and the conviction to do the money talk that will serve this vision. And may your whole lives be a joyful dedication to God. May our life together seek to live out a flourishing and fruitful promise that is still to come. May it be for you as it is for me. Amen. We learnt a new song at camp. It's called Jubilee, and we'd like to introduce it to the congregation today.
like everyone to hold their fruit or grab a fruit. You might even want to hold it to your heart. This fruit represents your life. I wonder what are the gifts that God has given you to share with others? What time has God given you to share with others? What prayer has God given you to pray for others? What hopes, dreams, responsibilities has God given to you? to plant, to nurture, and to grow. What gift of God has shaped your own life in such a way that you cannot help but share it now with others? What is on your heart today? that you want to return to God with joy and with thanksgiving. Hold your fruit, whether it feel too small and not enough, or whether it is full and ripe and the very best that you can give. Hold it and know that it is blessed in God's hands, it is more than enough. Now let us dedicate our first fruits. Let us pray. Holy God, it is not always easy to give what we have. We count our pennies, we weigh the pros and cons. We calculate what we have given before and we remind ourselves what we are giving now. We all have money stories. And yet, even though it can take work for us to practice release, we trust that you can take these gifts however freely or reluctantly given, and use them to build a more beautiful world. For that is who you are. You are forever building castles out of sand, disciples out of people, and new life out of cautious, humble, gifts. And so we pray. We believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we dedicate with thanksgiving and joy the first fruits of this St Andrew's congregation. Grow in us and through us your generous Jubilee spirit. Amen. You are now invited as a sign of commitment to come forward and to place in the basket your fruit. And into this same basket you might like to bring your offering if you're not already offering online or a paper pledge form if you haven't yet had a chance to do that. And as is the ancient custom, we will make a joyful noise as people come forward and offer their gifts. So come when you are ready.
don't know, that our baskets go to Gateway Family Services, which is run out of Blacksling United Church, and it's a feeding and supporting ministry. So you can bring along, what kind of things can you bring along, Howard? What kind of things go in the baskets? Uh, anything, anything, anything you can give. Anything that you can give. <laughs> and it's preferably things that don't go off, like, you know, things that are in packets. Yeah, that's right. You've got to make, make sure that anything doesn't go off in, in, in the yeah. So when we take up our offering, you can always give alongside this to support our ministry there. Thanks, Howard. So our community <coughs> announcements. Here are some pictures from our church camp we had last weekend. Uh, unfortunately, Elena Linter is away today. She was sick and she missed out on camp and I wanted to take the opportunity to acknowledge and thank her for her behind the scenes work. So when you next see her, uh, please uh, thank her for uh, what she did to get us ready for camp and because it was pretty sad for her to miss out on it. But I would like to thank so many people. Elaine Choker, Ali, Vivian, Julie, Jason, they fed us over the weekend. I'd like to thank Andy, Miriam and Ali who led our workshops and John, Sasha, Elodie and Abby Rose who led our intergenerational activities and Mark who led our congregational meeting with support from Scott and from Elaine. So it was a beautiful team effort and we had a fabulous time together. In July, I'll try not to grin too much, I'm going on holiday. <laughs> I've got uh, two weeks annual leave followed by two weeks study leave. Uh, and as Neil was pointing out to me, my, part of my leave is attending a conference and speaking at another conference. But I'm going to Bali for the very first week of that holiday to celebrate a dear friend's 50th birthday and I can't wait. And my passport arrived, for those of you who have been following the saga online. <laughs> uh, so, during July, I've organised something really special. Uh, a dear friend, Reverend Nicole Fleming, uh, she's the ca uh, Candidates Formation Coordinator at the United Theological College, and her and her partner Eve and their little boy Ewan have just moved to Springwood. And she's going to be welcomed into the life of this congregation by taking responsibility for worship during July. God bless her. And so she's going to be leading you in worship during July. And she's invited her colleague, Anthony Reeves, Dr. Anthony Reeves, who's the Old Testament uh, lecturer at UTC, to do a three-week series on the Song of Songs. When have you heard the Song of Songs in church? I bet. Well, you're in for a treat. You're in for a treat. <laughs> Um, so please make all of them uh, feel really welcome because they're giving a huge gift to me so that they, I can be released, but it's really going to be a genuine treat for you. Uh, during that time as well, uh, gosh, aren't these gifts? Peter and Ian are going to step up and take on some more pastoral responsibility so that if there are any end of life care or funerals during that time that they will organise that together with this community. And the ministers at Lura and Springwood have also agreed to be back up um, in case we need support. So please support them as they take on that really important ministry with us. Now, I was going to be telling you that your dear friend Jean Howe is very unwell. Unfortunately, I received a phone call yesterday from her daughter, Debbie, to say that she passed away. Jean passed away with her son and daughter by her side, very peacefully. There was a sense of rightness about her life coming to its end. And yet I know that she is part of a particular group of people that have been here holding this place together for the longest of times and for those who knew and loved her dearly this will come as a huge heartache. So I'm holding you in my heart. Uh, Peter's taking the lead on organising a service. It's going to be a um, Thanksgiving service and it's probably not going to be for a few weeks. So there's a bit of pressure off. Uh, please let others in the community know who aren't here today. I've, I've tried to make a few phone calls to let some key people know. Uh, but that's really sad news. 
but also a reason to give thanks for her life and the love that she shared with this community. We're going to sing our final song. And we're going to sing it remembering all the words and the actions and the feelings that we have shared together in our service. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Let's stand together. Amen.